Molecular mimicry are two words that do a pretty good job of capturing the idea of enzyme inhibition. Enzyme inhibition really comes down to recognizing molecules apart from one another, or in the words of Roel Hoffman, recognition and its intended subversion, deception, are the modus operandi by which poisons in our body can harm us or pharmaceuticals can aid us. Hoffman uses in his book, as an example, the molecule tubocorarin as an inhibitor. Tubocorarin comes from the liana vine. It's the poison arrow dart material that basically blocks acetylcholine esterase. And so it, prop it prevents nerve propagation from taking place. It actually is a, an inducer of paralysis. It's even been used in lethal injections. How does it work? Well, basically it inhibits, by molecular mimicry, the action of acetylcholine esterase. The natural substrate of acetylcholine esterase is the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. We actually saw this enzyme before as one, or one of nature's most efficient enzymes. So how does this big molecule, tubocorarin, inhibit by mimicry the molecule acetylcholine? Well, let's do a little bit of superposition and see how those two are similar. Often's book, interestingly enough, is the same or not the same, and that's really the essence of what he's talking about here. The same or not the same, and is the big molecule tubocorarin the same or not the same to the enzyme acetylcholine esterase? Well, apparently, it's the same, and how can that be? We're going to do a superposition action, and so here's the structure, and we're going to look at one part of this molecule, which looks an awful lot like acetylcholine. So I'm just going to superimpose the molecule of acetylcholine on there, and now you can see it. Basically, I've just laid over the position starting with the ammonium cation and following that through, and you can see that the two molecules are likely to have, at least in this conformation, a very similar shape. It's no wonder that basically this molecule of tubocorarin comes in, blocks the site for of acetylcholine esterase from accepting any further molecules of uh, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So let's take a closer look at the ideas behind enzyme inhibition, at least in a general way. And basically there are really three types of enzyme in in inhibitors. Two major classes are irreversible and reversible, and in the reversible class, we've got two different types. They could either be competitive or non-competitive. Let's look at the kinetic schemes that distinguish these three classes of inhibitors. So basically, competitive inhibition, we're going to use uh, the typical model for enzyme catalysis shown here, but in the case of competitive inhibition, what we're going to do is we're going to have an equilibrium set up, since this is a reversible process, each step should be reversible, and indeed what happens is the enzyme inhibitor competes for the substrate to block the site, and once the inhibitor exists as the enzyme inhibitor complex, it's no longer able to accept the substrate, and so it's, an it's in an unreactive state. But as the inhibitor goes away, everything can reverse, and the normal mode of action can resume. Non-competitive inhibitors operate in a slightly different way. Basically, they don't occupy the same site as the substrate. So in other words, there's two binding sites on the enzyme, one that fills the inhibitor, and one that still binds the substrate. So we can have basically the possibility of a ternary complex, and all of these modes, anytime the inhibitor is bound, the enzyme becomes inactive. Anytime the enzyme is bound with the inhibitor, it becomes unreactive. Again, all of these steps are reversible, so non-competitive inhibition, just like competitive inhibition, can, um, can be reversible. Irreversible modes of inhibition are uh, shown over here, and in this case what we have basically is uh, a reaction will take place that will involve a covalent bond change. So first of all the enzyme inhibitor complex forms, but that's followed by a reaction which is irreversible. A covalent bond is formed between the enzyme and the inhibitor, and that makes that un an unreactive state there's a covalent complex that forms by a reaction that has a rate constant associated with it. That Ki, small ki, represents the rate constant by which that chemical change takes place. And so the way to distinguish these irreversible inhibitors shown here from the reversible Im inhibitors that we discussed initially is that if you were to monitor the rate of the reaction over time with the 
irreversible inhibitors, there would be a noticeable decay over time because this is not an instantaneous process. It's going to be a process that takes place according to the rate constant Ki. There's a special type of irreversible inhibitors that are known as suicide inhibitors, and we'll study some one example of those in the next webcast. And a suicide inhibitor basically tricks the enzyme into thinking that it's doing the chemistry that it normally is set up to do. But somewhere along the reaction pathway, this suicide inhibitor sets into mode a, a different mode of action, sets into place a different mode of action that causes the enzyme to uh, basically capture that in a covalent and irreversibly bound manner.